we're introduced to a quality and in, an innate already present quality in ourselves that we can always rely on and we call this open into are we ready to go sorry okay uh, we call this open intelligence and in order to practice what we we put forward here uh, you don't need any ideas you, you need an actual experience of what we're describing so in every open meeting we give the introduction the direct introduction to the nature of mind um, which we call open intelligence awareness clarity there are many words to describe it but the experience of it uh, is very easy so are you, are you ready I'm going to introduce you to open intelligence I've already introduced you to my imaginary friend <laughs> So thankfully open intelligence isn't an imaginary friend, it's an actual reality, a stable basis uh, that allows for all of our experience. So the way we introduce ourselves to open intelligence is just to stop thinking. And, and almost immediately, like I heard the bird saying you can't stop thinking no. <laughs> um, but when I when I practice this the stopping thinking you identify something in in you know what remains basically and for me there's 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 an op an open powerful relaxed expanse as soon as I try to try to <clears throat> try to find it with my intellect and pip hold on to it, it, it it's not possible so the instruction to stop thinking and stop describing is, is a very powerful one because most of us, this is how we try to make sense of anything. We describe, we think. Describe, do I like it? You know, what's he talking about? Is it like this thing I already know? And before, before we know it, we're off in more descriptions. So then you just stop thinking again, stop describing. Identify open intelligence. I like, I like the description, what's looking through your eyes, what's listening to me speak. So this is another way to identify open intelligence. Can you identify what's looking through your eyes? And again, for a brief moment, there's an expanse, an openness. It's powerful. It's relaxed. It's, it's there. You're not getting it. And so the practice of open, inte the practice of open intelligence the practice of recognizing the nature of mind is to <clears throat> allow for that recognition spontaneously to occur throughout your day. Identify open intelligence and just relax, just for a brief moment. So the actual practice is short moments of open intelligence, repeated many times, become continuous. And one important aspect of that is that whether you're thinking or not, this open intelligence is present. So we have many beautiful metaphors to describe the relationship between open intelligence and all of the thoughts and emotions, sensations and experiences that we we have during the day, which we just call data. So open intelligence and data are inseparable like the sky and the color blue. Open intelligence and data are inseparable like reflections in a crystal ball. So if I was to have a crystal ball here, I could I've done this before, but you, I could see you all upside down in the crystal ball, perfect little mini humans in the crystal ball. But it, what, what is actually inside the crystal ball? There's, there's nothing there, it's pure, it's open, it's empty of anything other than the purity of the crystal ball. But the reflections in the crystal ball, they are the dynamic energy of that purity. So I found this metaphor, and also the metaphor of a mirror, the mirror and the crystal ball are very similar very powerful because it, it's, it just describes very eloquently and beautifully the relationship between everything we experience and open intelligence. They're indivisible. So when we rely on this indivisibility throughout the day with this, this short moment's practice, so you're not trying to hold the recognition of open intelligence in place because you can't. You just touch in with the nature of mind throughout the day. And what you'll find is it, everything about your, your life that's happening is a reminder to recognize open intelligence. So we actually, we actually paid that guy, he, he was an actor, uh, to be drunk and to follow you around and then confront you 
in, in the day so that you'd have lots of powerful data to practice with. This of course isn't true, but, but for me personally, the more annoying someone is, I mean I'm annoyed all the time, irritation and annoyance, that's my base setting. And so before I met this training, that's how I, I would relate to everyone. I'm annoyed, you make me annoyed, I'm going to argue with you, I'm going to be very confrontational because in some, some way, if I can bring people either down to my level of depression or up to my level of annoyance, then somehow that makes me feel a bit better about the fact that I'm really annoyed. If I'm annoyed, everyone else needs to be annoyed as well because I can't stand happy, relaxed people. It's like you've got no right to be happy and relaxed. Don't you know how, how, how rubbish the world is? You know, like I, I just I hate myself, I hate everyone. This was my base setting. Um, and I, d I know I'm not alone in that. It, it, like the, 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 the fundamental basis of many, many people is just fr frustration and anxiety. And it's frustration and anxiety because you, there is no relief. No matter how hard I try, I cannot find relief. So, I used to drink, I used to take drugs, I used to do all these things in order to find relief. And I suppose in the world of reification there was some relief, but as I got older that the, the hangovers from doing drugs and alcohol were way worse than the, the afflictions that I was trying to escape from. So it got to the point where I, I'd always been interested in, in, in alternative ways to find relief, but it wasn't until I literally couldn't re resort to drugs and alcohol because the, hang the hangovers were so bad. I just had to stop. So that's when I, I, I would say I seriously started looking for alternatives because I couldn't take drugs and drink alcohol anymore. And by the way, I mean, if you have friends that take drugs and drink alcohol and you don't, I, I don't know about your experience, but being around people who are drunk and taking drugs when you're sober is the most boring thing. I mean, <laughs> what are they talking about? They're basically like barking like dogs saying the same thing over and over and over again like it's some fascinating universal secret they're just drunk and high and they won't remember anything about their really profound repetitive one sentence conversations that they're having I mean I can remember cocaine, alcohol, marijuana oh my god we've unlocked the secret of the universe uh, like just talking, talking, talking 14 hours, 14 hours you know like more drugs, more alcohol, more marijuana, oh, it's so profound, wow. And then, you know, you fall asleep, sleep for 18 hours, wake up, feel thoroughly miserable, haven't got any idea about what you were talking about the night before. Maybe you do, but it certainly isn't profound anymore. <laughs> and so, you know, it was clear to me that this, this way of, of relating to myself and others is a complete waste of time, and as I said, it got to the point where I couldn't continue. And when I was sober and I wanted to hang out with my friends who were taking drugs and alcohol and dr smoking, you know, so I did. I, I'd last 20 minutes before I'd just leave. It's just, this is really boring. You're really boring. You know, I didn't say that. I just, you know, we have discernment. We choose where we go and who we hang out with. And so if you're in an environment where there's lots of drunk people, or even a drunk person. And if you're walking down the street and there's somebody walking and shouting and insulting everyone and they're going the same way as you, just turn around and go the other way. That's what I would do. It's, it's super simple. And um, I, I mean, I have so many, so many, I used to be very confrontational, very good at confronting people insulting people. I'm better at insulting people than anyone I know, you know, and that's, that's how I would respond to the situation that you described before. When I did the 12 empowerments, I, um, I was in Rishikesh. I'd been living in Rishikesh for around five years and, um, there was one point, I think it was Shiva Atri, where Rishikesh is crowded anyway, 
but um, in in many Hindu festivals, uh, it gets so crowded y you wouldn't believe. And uh, if you're from India, you pr you probably know what I'm talking about. But if if you're from, I'm from London, which is a crowded city, and crowded in London is nothing like crowded in India. Honestly, I lived maybe one mile from Ram Jula, which is the bridge that goes across the Ganga in Rishikesh. And it, you know when you come out of a concert, a big concert, I don't know, I'm, I'm so old, I'm, I'm so out of touch, I haven't been to a concert for like 20 years probably. I'm trying to think of, anyway. So a very popular concert, and when, when everyone goes to leave and it's, it's a stadium and you go to the exits, you can sometimes lift your feet up and just be carried along <laughs> because it's so crowded and so crammed. And so the entire maybe three or four kilometres around Ramjula was like that. And it took me, and this is, this is not, I had, because this was my first time in Rishikesh, I had my motorbike, so I was walking along like this in the crowd with my motorbike thinking that, you know, somehow it's going to stop at some point. But what actually happened was I, I was suddenly confronted by maybe four or five Indian men with sticks screaming at me. And I couldn't understand a word that they were saying, but I think I'd walked uh, my motorbike over either one of their feet or their wife's foot or something. And, and um, they're screaming in my face and I'm, like I said, I was very confrontational, so I'm just like there, like completely ready to, okay, I'm gonna, I can knock two of them out before they beat me with the sticks. But then it was like, oh my God, there's all this anger and all this, this I've got to fight, I've got to punch, I've got to eat like this, but there was just an explosion of openness and relaxation. And this was just after the 12 empowerments and I'm like going, oh my God, recognize open intelligence. This is amazing, <laughs> recognize open intelligence. And I'm, I'm like, what are you doing? You're gonna, you're gonna die, they're gonna beat you, they're gonna beat you, you've gotta do something. And I'm just like, it, everything was just like power, relaxation, openness. And I just, I was just like, I'm, I'm, I can't understand what you're saying. I'm really, I'm sorry, I'm very sorry. I'm saying, no, you can't say that. And, and, and it, was, it was amazing because everything was inseparable from this power. And that's all I said. I just said, I can't understand you. I'm really, really sorry. And they just, you know, they stopped being angry. They calmed down. And then I wheeled my bike a bit further and just stopped at the side of the road and I just sat on a bench like this. My hands were shaking because I, you know, I, th I thought I was going to get beaten and and I sat there for two minutes just practicing short moments with all of this data and it was completely gone. The whole situation, all the data, all this shaking, gone. And I'm like, this this was so different to how I used to be because no matter how, what the outcome had been from that confrontation, whether it had been a fight or, or peaceful or whatever, I would have been holding on to that situation and data for weeks not hours or minutes, for weeks, I'd have been disrespectful, angry and aggressive to every Indian I'd met, you know, just holding on to this anger. So this was, this was for me, just complete evidence of the efficacy of short moments and how it really is the solution to potentially co confrontational situations. And it absolutely doesn't exclude using force to extricate yourself from a situation or to protect your friends or whatever. There, we have many, many examples of, you know, restraining people, stopping people fighting whilst relying on open intelligence and things like this. And even me many examples of using wrath and using physical violence in order to, you know, it, you can't say, you can't be black and white. And so when you rely on open intelligence, what comes to the fore is a spontaneous discernment that is completely breathtaking. So you're doing Empowerment 5 now, so some of the, the, the uh, specific situations that you were talking about, you can actually write them down in, on your list. Actual situations all the data that comes up for, came up for you or still comes up for you, maybe the blame and the judgment because you didn't act 
or may maybe the blame and the judgment because you did act in a certain way. So all of this, so your questions are like empowerment five and four questions, they're great and they'll, they'll be resolved by looking at them within this framework. But I can share with you from my experience that, and I, I, I shared this the other day, that you're no longer restricted by what you think you should do or what you hope is going to happen or what you fear isn't going to happen or is going to happen. Once you, once you, you have access to this great wisdom, you have access to all of your data, but you're not restricted by it anymore. So it doesn't mean that you, you come across a situation and you don't utilize your conventional intelligence, but you're not restricted by it because your conventional intelligence might say, oh God, I, I, I shouldn't, I can't do this because I don't, you know, I'm, I've been told that this is not the right way to do things, but open intelligence is inseparable from that and it will allow you to act in a way that's beneficial. So one of the questions that Candice Rinpoche says that you can ask in any situation, it's a bit like, would my mother let me do this? Or what would my mother like me to do in this situation? But it's completely different. It's what would be of most benefit in this situation? And usually it becomes very, very clear, not just to you, but for the situation as a whole, it becomes very clear what the best course of action is. And if that isn't the case, usually you don't need to to act immediately or make a decision immediately. Now you've, you're have you well on the way to completing the 12 empowerments, you'll have a personal empowerments trainer that you can then say, write to and say, this is the situation. Um, I did this before and it didn't really work out. Um, can you give me some advice? So it's great to have uh, the support of somebody that's that's relying on the four mainstays, who will then who will then be able to give you specific advice, and may even have been in a similar situation. So it's it's it, it, there's no way to hide anymore. You act in the way you need to act. That might that might include not acting or not saying something too, because that's action. But um, yeah, it's it's infallible, it can't fail. It, it's such a beautiful support system and it allows you to be courageous, powerful and just go for things that you might not have done before because you just, you know, just I won't do that, I'll just avoid them. I'm 52 now and since I was 20 I, I was very, very interested in the nature of reality and philosophy of the nature of reality. I found it really, really interesting. And I went to satsangs and meetings and teachers and trainers for, well, how long is that, 18 years before I met this training, discussing the nature of reality. Does open intelligence ever start? Does it ever finish? Mm. <laughs> you know, like, and we could talk and philosophize about all these in intellectually interesting questions for th thousands of years, humanity has done that for thousands of years. What is the I? Where is the I? Does the I start ever? Does it begin? Does it, you know, all of this? And, and the nature of reality, and it's fascinating, but it has, it has not led to the actual recognition of the nature of reality for anyone. And, and more importantly, it, it hasn't really led to great unending benefit for anyone. So this is what we want and this is what we need, f humanity needs right now. Um, so I know Candice, I used to ask questions like that. One of the questions I used to ask, I, I just get so annoyed at my younger self for these questions. <laughs> if there's only one thing here, how can you and I communicate? Because you need, you know, like, how how is that happening? It's like, you need to think, you know, I need to speak to somebody. And, something, something like and Candice looks at me like this and she just went, well, we could talk about that, but how about you go away and practice short moments and then come back and tell me what that's like for you? And for me, it was so refreshing to have a teacher that wasn't going to play the game anymore. That wasn't going, you know, wasn't going to refer to intellectual argument and discussion but always put very lovingly put the ball back and give the ball back to me and just say well here we practice recognition of the nature of reality 
right now. So if you want an intellectual answer, you could say that the end and the beginning of open intelligence, it happens and it doesn't happen right now, at the same time. It's like, hmm, <laughs> you know. And Candice Rinpoche is so skillful in her construction of, of the Twelve Empowerments, it's like, I mean, you don't really need teachers. We, we're just there to, to see if you, you're misunderstanding something. You could have cardboard cutouts of teachers <laughs> with like a mouth that, that just is like this so that you, you feel a bit secure because there's, there's something representing <laughs> someone that's in charge, basically. But the, uh, the point of the matter is the 12 empowerments in particular are so skillful. They just lead you on and questions come up that are dealt with in that empowerment that day and then, you know, or the whole structure, but intellectually, some of the sentences, they're just fantastic. There is no one who has ever not recognised open intelligence. So try thinking about that just for a few seconds. It's like your brain, you can, you can hear the sparks as it starts to <laughs> short circuit. My favourite is, um, there never will be recognition of open intelligence because there never has been non-recognition of open intelligence. Non-recognition of open intelligence is just a label and there is no one who has ever not recognised open intelligence. <laughs> it's so relaxing. It's just you just give up. You know, the, the intellect, the human intellect is, is a very powerful tool. But as we heard Candice Rinpoche say, unless it's, it's combined with, with the the inseparable recognition of the nature of mind, open intelligence, love and great benefit, then the progress that we make with our brilliant intellects is very limited and often harmful. There's a lot of weaponization of technology, for example. So with the recognition of open intelligence right now, as your data, you become superhuman, you become, you're awesome. Even, you know, like regardless of what you think, Regardless if your descriptions are, I'm a loser, I'm depressed, I have pan panic attacks. You're awesome, but that awesomeness, it's inherent and it, it, it's inseparable from all of the things you don't like about yourself, all of the things you like about yourself too. So empowerment five, you get to see that, not in, well, maybe intellectually, but also as an actual experience, when I did Empowerment 4 and 5, it was game over, in a good way, game, game over when, when you, you know, not game over. <laughs> it was game over in terms of reification and I almost found, found, and I had to ask the teachers, I've just made my entire life up. It's just a fabrication. I could have described it any way I wanted to. I just chose to describe it. You're Adrian, you're a loser. Everything about you says that you're a loser and your life is rubbish. And so the 12 empowerments allow you to just stop doing that and recognize the perfection in, of, as and through everything in your life, positive, neutral and negative.